Romans 8, 12 to 17. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to, a living, to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of your body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Man does not live by bread alone. Good morning again, and we are um, back in the book of Galatians, which I'm excited about, and we took a little bit of a break there, back in the Uh, this weekend and what we have coming up, some of the themes here in the book. And it made me think of Martin Luther King Jr. Many of, some, some folks have off this Monday, but Martin Luther King Jr., he was a man who held fast to his message of equality and rights for all under tremendous pressure. Uh, he, this picture is from his time in a Birmingham jail, and every Martin Luther King Jr. day, I really, uh, I take time to read his letter from the jail cell, or jail uh, cell there in Birmingham. And while he was there, eight uh, religious leaders, white religious leaders, came out with a public statement. And they really were cautioning and somewhat critical of Martin Luther King Jr. and the movement. And he says in this letter, you know, I rarely take time to respond to criticisms. But he felt like King, King's thoughts were these guys who said these comments, they were men of he called genuine goodwill, and that their criticism were sincerely set forth. So he takes some time to respond to them and some of their uh, questions and concerns that they had. So if you read the letter, there are, so, there are so many quotes in there that you could pull out, but I thought of sharing one this morning that I, I thought was appropriate and uh, really liked. So, King said in the letter, he said, the early Christians rejoiced when they were deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was the thermostat that transformed the mores of society. And you'll, you'll find quotes like that all throughout the letter, just really rich um, and, and good things to meditate on. But King, he was a man that held fast to his message, even under tremendous pressure to change his message. Pressure came to King not only from people outside of his circle, you know, to, to stop doing what he was doing, stop preaching what he was preaching or saying, but even from those who were within who wanted it to be more radical and violent, and King was uh, a pacifist, so he believed uh, to do these things without resorting to violence. Um, this morning, we're going to see this idea of holding fast, even under tremendous pressure. Fables, 
are stories, Aesop's fables are famous. They're fictional stories, usually animals play the, part, the speaking parts, but there's a point to the story. Today we're going to read a story, history, but it's not history for just history's sake that Paul's going to relate what, he, what, he, what, what has happened to him. Rather, he's trying to make a point like a fable. Paul's audience uh, that he's writing to, it's easy, especially when we read these words, to forget this. He's writing to Christians, to the churches of Galatia. And so I highlighted the area here. This is modern-day Turkey. And the whole letter is written to Christians, not written to non-Christians, not written to people in Jerusalem. It's written to people outside of Jerusalem in Turkey, a scattered group of churches. And he's sharing this story with really deep implications for them. You see, what was happening was false teachers showed up in Galatia, and what we'll read today is false brothers show up in Jerusalem. And what they were teaching was this. You not only had to believe in Jesus, but you had to follow certain aspects of the Mosaic law. There were certain things. So it was faith plus works. What we'll see in chapter 3, Paul uses, uh, in the King James it says, O oh, oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? In modern translations it says, who has cast a spell on you? That can happen. As Christians, we can be bewitched. We can almost have a spell cast on us from outside pressure. And we have to resist, hold fast to the gospel message. So this morning, I want to encourage us, hold fast to the message that salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone. So we need, to, we need to cherish that and champion it. Put, bound, put a fence around it. Hold firm to it. So let's read Paul's words here to the Galatians of his story, a time when he went up to Jerusalem. Galatians chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 1 through 10 this morning. Paul begins, he says, Then after 14 years, this is... 14 years since his conversion, he says, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles. In order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain, but even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel, to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing that I was eager to do. Let's pray. God, we desire to hear from you this morning. 
God, would you speak through me? Would your spirit just be with your word this morning, the preaching of your word? God, transform us. We don't want to be people who just have a lot of head knowledge. We really want to be transformed by what we read. For to lead us to deeper places of worship of you, Father, and deeper places where we really image and look like your son, Christ. Father, please give us word, our ears to hear and a heart to receive your word and a will to obey. In Christ's name, amen. This morning, we want to hold fast to the message that salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone. By holding fast, what I mean is this. Standing firm when you face pressure to capitulate the gospel message. By holding fast, I mean living in the freedom that is found in Christ Jesus and not returning to slavery under the law. And by holding fast, what I mean is that that idea of even holding fast, that's a, to the gospel message is a community effort to our benefit. Let's look at that first one, standing firm when you face pressure to capitulate the gospel message. If we look at the story here, it's been 14 years since Paul came to Christ, since he, Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus and just changed his life forever. And Paul explains why he went. He had a revelation, a vision. Somehow God communicated to the Apostle Paul, I want you to go up to Jerusalem, and I want you to go and talk to the pillars to the people who are influential in the Jerusalem church, so James and Peter and John and other brothers, and I want you to, to, have, to get unity, to have a united front together for the gospel message. And so Paul completely and fully obeys them. Uh, here in the story, we see that these false brothers, they sneak in, they slip in, to spy. So you can, you can sense that there's like a, a subversive motive here. They, they're, they're coming in and they have a different message, these false brothers. And they have a message which is Jesus plus do good works. Jesus plus follow the law. And, and they spy. They want to enslave the church to that message. And what it reminds me of is like in any church, in any church, you're going to have people who are present. You know, here we have, think about James and Peter and John. There were false brothers who were able to slip in, to sneak into the church. And so that can happen even today. So just because people go to church or they're part of us or they come to events, it doesn't make them part of the body of Christ. And so to be a member of the household of God is to have faith in Christ Jesus. It's not merely just religious participation. They had, uh, you know, Paul and Barnabas and Titus... They must have had tremendous pressure, and even consider James and Peter and John, tremendous pressure from the outside to change the gospel message. Man, if you guys just preach that it's not just Jesus, but also following the law, think about how many Jews you could appeal to and win over if you go that route. So they probably were facing tremendous pressure from all sides to capitulate, to surrender the gospel. Now, why, why do they zero in on circumcision? So this is, Paul, this is the first time Paul talks about circumcision, and circumcision is what the Galatians were dealing with. The false teachers there were saying, you have to believe in Jesus and get circumcised. And the reason why they focused on circumcision is that circumcision was the sign under the Old Covenant that a person belonged to 
to God's people, to the covenant community. So you either belonged to the covenant community or think about the act of circumcision. If you didn't receive it, you were cut off from the covenant community. And so circumcision was a sign of what God would do. If you have faith in God and his promises, he will cut away your sins. It will be bloody and messy, so it pointed to Christ, but he will cut away your sins. And if you fail to receive circumcision, then you will be cut off, like circumcised, cut off from God's people. So circumcision was a huge part of the Old Testament community. God commanded it. And so, you know, do we as Christians have to follow circumcision? Do we, have to, do we have to go through that process? The issue really came down to this, was trying to achieve justification through keeping the law. That's what Paul says. You're trying to get right with God by keeping the law. And Titus, he becomes a test case because Titus isn't Jewish. He's a Gentile. He's never been circumcised. So he comes along and Titus is, is now, well, what are we going to do with Titus? Now, is Titus part of the people of God by faith alone in Jesus, or does he also need to be circumcised? Can you imagine going to that, you like show up and now they're talking about circumcising you and your need to be circumcised? Uh, probably a real downer, right? You know, you're at this meeting, you know, and... But Titus is this test case now. So what must a person, what must a person do to be saved? I get asked this question a lot by people who are seekers. They're interested in Christianity or by new Christians. What does a person have to do to be saved, really? And the answer to that question is that we have to receive and rest on Jesus alone as he's offered to us in the gospel. So we read the gospel message, and as the Bible presents Jesus, I am the resurrection and the life. You know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, I give people uh, who were dead in their sins spiritual life. I die for sins. As we read these things, we rest and receive Christ alone. We rest on his work alone. The gospel is not what do I have to do, what laws do I have to obey to get right with God. The gospel is that Jesus obeyed all the law of God and sacrificed himself and rose again, and by resting on him alone in his work, we are saved. Not resting on what we can do, but resting on what he has done for us. That's the gospel. That's what it it means to be saved. You abandon all hope in yourself, and all of your hope is in Jesus. That's the gospel. Now, these uh, early Christians, there was uh, a sense at which we talked about capitulating the gospel message or surrendering it. How are we pressured to surrender the gospel message? And there are a couple ways that this happens. Our culture tells us that what? The gospel is too narrow. You're being too narrow-minded. You're not being inclusive. It's, It's too exclusive. And so we feel the pressure to conform. How can you say that there is only one way to heaven? That is pressure to capitulate the gospel message. And we face that. You know, we're called bigots or narrow-minded, when all we're doing is believing and communicating what God's Word has to say. We're also faced to capitulate or surrender the gospel in that you can live however you want, right? We, our society says we should just completely accept a person no matter what, total acceptance of an individual, but the gospel message involves a call to repent, to turn away from how you want to live, to turn in faith to God, to surrender yourself. We're also faced to capitulate the gospel sometimes as Christians 
Because to be a Christian, I think even here recently, is associated with a certain political belief or beliefs or social values or economic values. So for some people, it's like you, gotta, you, you can only be a Christian and be a liberal, or you can only be a Christian and be a conservative. And so those two things get linked together. I mean, I've, I've seen Christians who start to doubt a person's salvation based upon their, their lack of conservative beliefs or their lack of liberal beliefs. You know, so these, these are ways in which we are being forced to capitulate the gospel. A person is a Christian not if they believe in Jesus and they're Republican or they believe in Jesus and they're Democrat. A person is a Christian if by faith alone they believe in Christ alone. That puts them in the family of God. So when we speak of holding fast, we need to stand firm and hold tightly to the gospel. And this holding fast we looked at also involves living in the freedom that's found in Christ Jesus and not returning to slavery under the law. When we speak of slavery under the law, Paul has like some really specific ideas here, but I want you to look at the false brothers. They're compared to spies who sneak in, infiltrate the church. If the church leaders in Jerusalem, if they accept circumcision, they have to accept the whole law. And here's the reason why. You can't, when it comes to God, you can't select what you're going to believe and practice. You know, you can't, because that's telling God, here's what's true and here's what's right and these things aren't. And you actually then stand above God's word. So if you're going to come, what Paul's saying is, if you're going to hold a circumcision, you can't just hold a circumcision alone. You have to perfectly obey all the law of God. You got to live by it all, not just one little part. Living by and under the law, Paul says, enslaves us. So how does the gospel give freedom? This is really important. How does the gospel give freedom? Tim Keller, in his commentary on Galatians for you, he says the gospel brings about two types of freedom. The first is cultural freedom. So in moralistic religion you have to adopt a very specific set of rules and regulations, like what you can wear and what you can watch and what you can listen to. And I, I was part of my early Christian journey included some really fundamental groups. The church that I started attending as a Christian, as a teenager, was what you would call independent fundamental Baptist. You know, the King James Version was the only version you could read from. And women had to dress a certain way, and you couldn't go to movies, and you couldn't do this, and you couldn't do that. And I went to a college for a year and a half called Pensacola Christian College, which was ultra-conservative. I'm talking waking up at 2 a.m. for hair checks because your hair couldn't touch your ears. Because to be a Christian meant that your hair can't touch your ears, you know? And so it starts to get eerily specific. So Keller says this, if your salvation depends upon obeying the rules, then you want your rules to be very specific and doable and clear. You don't want love your neighbor as yourself because that's an impossibly high standard which has endless implications. You want, don't go to movies, don't drink alcohol, don't eat this type of food. And so Keller goes on and he says this. He says, elevating cultural propriety to the level of spiritual virtue leads Christians to a slavish emphasis on being culturally nice and proper, as well as promoting intolerant and prejudiced attitudes. So we get to a place and it's and this is why it's slavery. If you've ever lived under a system like this, you know what I'm talking about. You've got a million pounds around your spiritual neck weighing you down. 
It's slavish. Keller also says that the gospel leads to a second type of freedom, emotional freedom. Think about if your Christian life was, here is a specific set of rules, and in order to be a Christian, you have to keep them perfectly. Imagine your emotional state. And some of us have lived there. We beat ourselves up. Our lives look like a roller coaster. When we're obeying the rules really well, we're at the top. And then when we're not doing it so well, we're at the very bottom. And so our lives are like this emotionally. And so a slave to kind of earn your way, you're on this endless treadmill of guilt and insecurity. So if you're, if you're um, peace with God, that you have peace with God is based upon your keeping of the law, you're always insecure. But if your peace with God is based upon what Jesus has done when he said on the cross, it is finished, if it's based on his resurrection, if it's based on his work, then you have security. You have true peace. We, we struggle as Christians. What's our relation to the law? I guess then my relation to the law is, well, I have grace in Jesus, so I can, I can sin and grace covers it. And Paul says, no, right? Paul says, that is not what I'm promoting. So what's our relationship to the law? Well, it's no longer, we're no longer using the law to try to obtain salvation. Rather, salvation has been obtained for us, so we use the law as a way to love God. It's a way that we understand what shows him love and what pleases him. Our salvation isn't at stake, but now I know how to please and love God. I know what that looks like. And so that's our relation to the law. When we speak of holding fast, we need to stand firm and hold tightly to the gospel. We are to live in the freedom that's found in Christ Jesus and not return to slavery under the law. And finally, holding fast to the gospel message, it's a community effort to our benefit. Let me explain it this way. There's a practical reason that Paul goes to Jerusalem. It's for unity's sake. It's to be together for the gospel. Paul's calling, he makes clear his calling as an apostle and his message is independent of the other, other apostles. He didn't go see the other apostles until three years after his conversion, after he had already been making disciples, after he had already been called as an apostle, and then 14 years later. So he's like, guys, I didn't run right up to get trained by the apostles. Jesus called me. He gave me the message. But he goes up, James, Peter, and John, you know, they don't make Paul an apostle. They don't validate, that is, authenticate or authorize his message. If you read chapter 2, what did they do? They saw that God's grace was at work in Paul's life. They heard his message, and they affirm him. They affirm his calling as an apostle and his message. Think about a collector, uh, anybody who collects certain items. And, and for this, I picked a Shelby Cobra Mark II. Now, if someone came up to a Shelby vehicle and they saw it, whether or not they recognized it as a Shelby, it would still be a Shelby, right? Them recognizing it they're just recognizing it for what it is. They're not adding anything to it. They're not, they're not somehow creating it to be something that it isn't. It, it is that. And so this is what the apostles, what, what Peter and James and John do. They don't make Paul an apostle or make his gospel message the gospel message. They just affirm it. They, they see that it's genuine and it's true and right. They, he says, they didn't add anything to me. They didn't add anything to my message. They affirmed me. In a real practical way, God moves to create needed unity. Because the implication was, 
if the pillar said something different, then all of Paul's work that he had been doing, the churches would fracture and splinter. So it was important for the leaders of the church to have a unified front for gospel work and for them to work together. And we'll see next week in this story, Paul goes to Jerusalem. Next week, Peter comes to Antioch. So it's cool to see what's happening here. He, he says that they ask him to only, only for one favor, one request they ask of him, to remember the poor. Now, why this call to remember the poor? Why do they ask this? And this, this isn't just the poor in general. This is the poor Christians in Jerusalem that had been persecuted. Land had been taken from them. Businesses were taken from them because they they were no longer Jewish. They they started to follow Jesus as Messiah and they faced persecution. And and so uh, the apostles say, remember the poor here. And and Paul says, that's the very thing I, I want to do. In fact, he takes up a collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem. But why this call to remember the poor. It's because this is God's heart in the gospel. We were in a state of poverty. We we lacked life, and God comes to us, we read, with his spiritual riches, and he enriches us. He saves us. God's heart is, is for the poor, and we are all poor in spirit. That's how you have to come to God. God, I'm needy. I I can't save myself. I need you to do for me what I can't do for myself. Also, the reason why I think they asked him to remember the poor is because it's easy. it would be easy for Paul to go back to Antioch and for Barnabas to go back to Antioch and for them to just do their work where they're at. They can, we can get so focused. And so what the pillars are asking is, hey, remember us. Don't forget about us. While you go out and do your work, remember about our work here too. Remember us. They have the same message. What we get from this is they have the same gospel message, but they have different ministry fields. They're, Peter, James, and John are called to evangelize and make disciples among those who are circumcised. And Paul and Barnabas and Titus are to go to those who are uncircumcised. Same message, different ministry fields. The final item I wanted to just point out here was how do we relate with leaders or to leaders? I think this is important because we struggle with this at times. Paul was not being disrespectful to Peter and James and John. He recognized their calling. He gives them proper respect, but he is also reminding us, don't overestimate or worship your leaders. They are not God, and the gospel didn't come from them. They're under the gospel. They're under the Lord, too. So be careful. I love, Paul says here, God doesn't show favoritism, or how it's literally said is this, God does not receive the face of man. God does not receive the face of man. We are so prone to look at a person and we receive them because of who they are, their face. But God doesn't just look at a person's external. He considers who they are internally. And God doesn't play favorites. Tomorrow is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And I want to encourage you, maybe a practical step, it's just tomorrow I want to encourage you to read, not only read your Bible, but I encourage you to read the letter from the Birmingham jail. Stand firm. But remember, right, Martin Luther King Jr., he's just a man like we are. You know, he, he's not God. Our hero, we only have one hero, and his name is Jesus. Consider his holding forth the truth in the face of pressure and opposition. Our hero, Jesus, consider all the persecution, all the opposition he faced. And I mean, he stood tall and he faced it. He resisted 
the calls to capitulate. He stood firm. So hold fast to the message that salvation is by faith alone and in Christ alone. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning and an opportunity in which we can read your word. Your word is, we don't just live by bread alone, it's important, but God, we live by your word. It, it nourishes us. I pray that your words would this morning. Father, speak to us specifically about practical application, what this looks like for our lives. Thank you for the gospel message that we were saved by faith alone in Christ alone. Thank you that we don't have to be on a treadmill and just keep working and working and working, but our security can be found in Christ and his work. Help us as a community to stand firm when we face pressure to capitulate the gospel message. Help us to live in the freedom that's found in Christ and not return to slavery. Help us to hold fast to the gospel message as a community and to make that our effort to our benefit and to our community's benefit. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.